the end of democracy. In my book, The New Barbarian Manifesto, I predicted an age of rage. That was 20 years ago. Uh, it seems I was right. Riots or peaceful protests, it depends which end of the political spectrum you stand. Riots in Gulf cities across the USA, Britain, Europe, Australia. Whether it is the fascists or anti-fascists, Extinction Rebellion, Social Justice Warriors, Black Lives Matter, the West is seething with a self-justified rage. All groups are demanding that governments make changes. Expensive changes. These demands are undermining democracy, for a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until a majority of voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury, that is, out of taxation. This shrewd statement was the insight of Alexander Titler, Lord Woodhousley, some 200 years ago. But going back much further uh, in time, to ancient Greeks, the birthplace of democracy itself, we find a much more famous critic. More than 2,000 years ago, the philosopher Plato concluded that democracy always mutates into tyranny. In his Republic, he listed five forms of governmental system in a kind of order of merit. Uh, first, monarchy, ruled by a king or an aristocracy. Then, timocracy, uh, ruled by an aggressive class that is driven by a code of honour. Then, oligarchy, ruled by the wealthy few. Then, democracy, ruled by the people. And finally, tyranny, ruled by a tyrant. I would also place anarchy, a period without government, uh, a tipping point between democracy and tyranny. Plato was quite clear that there could only be one form of just government, namely ruled by wise philosopher kings. Here, the baser instincts of the political leadership are kept in check by rational understanding and by the virtuous sense to suppress personal desires. In this ideal, the, the guardians of an aristocratic society are not focused on acquiring property for themselves. However, factions eventually arise, leading to feuding and the breakdown of social order. Every aristocratic government eventually deteriorates to a timocracy. The guardians seize all property and enslave those whom they served the leaders of a democracy do not operate under any moral constraint, rather within a code of honour through which they maintain a stable community. Increasingly, they become seduced by wealth to a point where what was honourable and virtuous is displaced by the might of oligarchs. Wealth, not ability, is the qualification for social position. An us and them polarity divides society. The poor are obliged to organize in self-defense and eventually force the oligarchs from power. Government then becomes a lottery, a popularity contest, a democracy. Plato is clear that democracy, ruled by the mob, the mode of governance so close to the hearts of modern Western leaders on which they are present, presently promoting across the globe is intrinsically self-destructive, a la Alexander Titler. Democracy is undermined and eventually destroyed with everybody taking to the streets, knowing their rights without accepting any responsibility. The poor and other self-identifying groups, who are, are slaves in all but name, will rally to any ideology that trumpets their condition. Champions of their cause will arise. However, 
the taste of power among the champions soon changes everything. But by then it's too late. Democracy is doomed. Enter the tyrant. But tyranny is caught in a dilemma. To, to maintain his support, a tyrant must seize assets and redistribute the wealth among his cronies. And eventually we're back with a king and an aristocracy. Because of the present social unrest, I predict that the West is on the cusp between democracy and tyranny. In the new globalized socio-economic conditions, governments chosen by the majority are governments chosen by losers. They are losers because labor has become a commodity and must compete on price. The International Labour Organization calculates that nearly a billion workers have entered the global job market. Why should the world's subemployed all live in developing countries? Automation and exportation of jobs is sending shockwaves through Western work workforces previously protected by national interests, but which are now incapable of fending off foreign incursions. Because of the minimum wage, companies are lowering staffing levels. It's no accident that most are instigating, downsizing, delayering and outsourcing programs. Because of computerized production, the structured world of semi-skilled labor that arose out of the Industrial Revolution is now disintegrating. In the UK today, more people work in Indian restaurants than in iron and steel, shipbuilding and coal industries combined. Meanwhile, the politicians still pretend to be in control. Both the knaves and the naive pander to the masses, as they must. They say they can conjure up hundreds of thousands of new jobs for the huge number of soon-to-be unemployed. What a nerve. Businesses create jobs. Talent creates jobs. Government creates non-jobs and pensions in waiting, all paid for by taxes. In doing so, they tax real jobs out of existence. And so we have a problem. Today, productivity is delivered by a technology needing only a few machine minders. A typical factory employs one man and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog, and the dog ensures that the man doesn't touch anything. So growth is created from talent, not from low-grade labor. It has been decoupled from employment. National economies can no longer grow themselves out of unemployment. A, a large population, particularly an uneducated and aging population, is now a liability. A major problem facing all Western governments. The 20th century, the century of the masses, is over. A degenerate political system based on manipulating those masses, is over too. But it won't go quietly. Now, as I mentioned already, I predicted this age of rage over 20 years ago in my New Barbarian Manifesto. Now, mindless social justice warriors and the like, manipulated by tyrannical ideologies, signal their virtue insisting on defunding the police and a fair redistribution of wealth, whatever fair means. The rule of law collapses before the will of the mob, as spineless politicians echo these impossible demands. Just as in ancient Rome, democracy can only hang on by force, paid for by soaking the rich. In response, the wealthy will look to escape, taking with them as much of their wealth as possible. Thus, a vicious circle of decline begins. A series of tiny tax hikes, each seeming so obvious, harmless, 
beneficially are the first steps on the road to perdition. There are no alarm bells. Life goes on. Only with each infringement, ethical standards drip away. Drip, drip, drip. Until the floodgates open and everybody pays. Then, instead of setting standards and punishing wrongdoers, the government is at it themselves. Cronyism is rampant. Government has become corrupt and corrupting. Strap for cash, they will steal, that is, tax anything in solid form from all sectors of society because there aren't enough rich to pay for everything. Taxes will inevitably rise for everyone on fuel, food, clothes, property. Who guards the guardians when morality collapses into vice? The socialist utopia of the will of the people voting for full employment and a minimum wage and unfair taxation is merely the turkeys voting for Christmas. To stay in power, the government needs to subsidise preferred voters and so it will stuff the turkeys. Don't think other political parties will make any difference. That's the trouble with elections. The government always wins. The rhetoric of all democratic politicians includes the redistribution of wealth to the voters. And if voting made a difference, they would have made it illegal. Whatever the government, confronted by various forms of rage across the population, they all face the same problem. Income collapsing and expenditure going through the roof. How dare chancellors call it a budget when they just steal even more from the public to pay for their mistakes? To justify their tax take, the state will profess a superior populist morality. However, the state's legitimacy does not stem from any unassailable moral position, rather from raw power, the domination of the individual by the tribe. This is the same immoral morality that deludes incorruptible tax collectors, smug in the rightness of their legitimate brutality. Uh, indeed, the enforcers of the state power, preening themselves in sanctimonious morality of the mob, are given the right to, nay, the obligation to, invade the privacy of its citizens, all for the common good. However, Calls to the common good don't wash with the wealthy, not even with the relatively well-off. For to them, the common good isn't good, it is merely common. Consequently, the wealthy are losing their faith in the democratic state, which supports the profligate and penalizes the thrifty. The state no longer delivers its side of the Faustian pact, where the individual submits to the legitimate violence of the state in return for security and protection, particularly protection from the mob. The James Bond myth that the state is good and global corporations spectre are bad it is blatant propaganda on behalf of the nation state. It's a morality tale told by tax collectors. James Bond, the patron saint of civil servants, the thug of state, is now just another dirty old man. The nation state does not stand on some moral high ground, rather than on a squalid collectivist doctrine. We are all equal in that we are all property of the state, or rather, of the leaders of the state. And those leaders can dispose of its property as they see fit. All taxation is theft. It is the state obtaining money with menaces. Government is merely legitimate organized crime. And even the mafia doesn't charge 60 to 70 percent. For that is what most of us will pay over our lifetimes. Taxation without representation may be tyranny. 
but it's a lot cheaper than the alternative. Democracy is dying across the West. Tyranny, here we come. Thank you.